Many, many thanks to both ambassadors, Jay Shankar and Saiki. It's really a huge thrill for me to be reunited uh, with two of the most impressive diplomats that I've ever worked with or seen in action. Uh, we have a really esteemed diplomat from South Asia who knows more about East Asia than uh, practically anyone on Earth and a terrific diplomat from East Asia who similarly has a tremendous wealth of experience in, uh, in South Asia. And what's really scary is that they both know the United States very, very, very well. So I'm looking forward to the chance to uh, peel some great wisdom out of uh, each one of them. I'd, I'll begin, if I could, with Ambassador Saiki in a way because although this is a subject of debate, at least the modern concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific really seems to have uh, its roots in the administration, the first term of the current Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, when uh, back in 2007, he visited New Delhi and gave a speech in which he talked about uh, creating an arc of democracies in the region. Uh, he called it the confluence of the Indian and the Pacific Oceans and uh, underscored the, how imperative it is for the democracies in the region to deepen cooperation. Uh, you, I think, uh, Saik san were in Washington then as the, as the deputy chief of mission. Uh, so this initiative was really the precursor to what we now, it's now called the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. Can you give us uh, some insight into how that came about and what, what the concept was that uh, then Prime Minister Abe was articulating? Yes, uh, thank you, Danny san Before uh, uh, speaking on this uh, subject matter, let me first of all uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be a part of this program uh, to discuss a very important subject, very extremely interesting and extremely important subject for all of us here. Um, I hope someone will help me uh, move the uh, slide to the, uh, the map, which I think uh, I have already prepared. Uh, people have uh, the handouts already, but I just want to, people to make sure that uh, the first page will be shown on the screen so that it is easier for me to explain about this concept of uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, free and openness of the, of the region. Um, Danny, you mentioned uh, that uh, Prime Minister Abe in his first administration in 2007 when he uh, visited uh, India, uh, he delivered a speech at uh, the Indian Parliament. And that speech was, uh, I'm sure that uh, Jay will uh, uh, describe even better for me about the reception by the Indian audience about uh, what he spoke about. Uh, um, he um, virtually uh, tried to connect the two oceans, Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And the, the, I think the notion that he had behind uh, this uh, vision is that uh, uh, center of growth, economic growth, I would say, uh, was uh, shifting from Europe to uh, Asia Pacific in long term, in the long run actually. And this shift started to uh, take place uh, from the 1960s, 70s, 80s. And we saw the rise of, uh, economically, rise of China we used to call three dragons or four dragons at that time, Hong Kong, um, Taipei, Taiwan, China. Um, all these uh, Chinese uh, you know, uh, regions were prospering. And Japan, South Korea, and ASEAN countries, uh, the membership increased to 10. But the ASEAN 10, thank you. OK, OK. Let me try. Good. Can you see? It's a bit blurred. But anyway, um, the ASEAN countries uh, included, they 
this region um, was joined by India afterwards. And the economic prosperity and uh, speedy development uh, really took place. Uh, and we wanted to bring in some uh, connectivity in the economic activities of these countries in the region. That, I think, is the original, uh, original idea of Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, uh, proposing this uh, uh, notion. Uh, but he elaborated this uh, uh, vision uh, later in 2013, when he came back as the Prime Minister. Uh, he visited uh, Nairobi, Kenya, to attend the uh, Japan-African countries uh, uh, conference. We call the TCAD meeting, Tokyo uh, International Conference on African Development. That was the sixth round of the uh, summit meeting that took place in Nairobi. And uh, Mr. Abe uh, officially announced using this term of uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. What does this mean? Uh, well, of course, we can discuss it later. But uh, basically, uh, Prime Minister wanted to uh, connect the two regions, or three regions, including Africa, so that we can all prosper together through cooperation in economic activities, including trade and investment. And oceans, we need to make sure that uh, free passage it should always be there. So this is a basic concept that uh, Ms. Abe wanted to share. Thank you. So Taik Sun, you've explained the economic underpinning and the economic rationale for this initiative uh, and for then Prime Minister Abe's outreach to India and as well as subsequently uh, to Africa in addition to the energy that he put into uh, visiting and uh, bolstering relations with a huge number of countries throughout the region. But he began by calling it uh, the arc of freedom and prosperity. He emphasized the importance of democratic nations uh, working together. Could you say a word about the sort of political dimension or the value dimension of this initiative? Well, I think, uh, you know, basically, uh, uh, Japan wants to see as many countries as possible in the region to uh, uh, have a democratic system and a free economic regime. And uh, the networks of uh, democracies and uh, free economies uh, should be the only way for Japan to prosper economically. That, I think, was a basic idea. Um, some people want to find a political implication when you talk about free uh, and uh, what was that? Open. Open uh, arch. Um, arch doesn't really mean much. I mean, you know, you just to connect the countries in the, in the region and it looks like an arch. But um, I think he has elaborated this uh, vision into this uh, free and open in the Pacific. No, well, later, in six years, actually. Maybe people were thinking of the Arc de Triomphe, which has, does have a military <laughs> connotation. Well, I'll, I'll politely disagree with you slightly on that in, in a moment, um, because I think there is really a, a strategic component uh, to calling for the union or the collaboration of uh, democracies. But let me turn to Ambassador Jai Shankar. Now, India certainly didn't need to be told about democracy or about prosperity. Um, but it was a, a significant moment when uh, the Japanese Prime Minister addressed the Indian Parliament. Uh, this is 2007, there was a lot going on. A lot of other things happened. If I did my homework correctly, I think you were still High Commissioner in Singapore, Singapore at the time. What's, what's your sense of how uh, 
how India reacted to this and and talk to us a little bit about uh, how the idea of integrated uh, uh, integrating the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean uh, has been part of mm -hmm. India's calculus. Okay, uh, look, uh, I mean, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me, and thank you all for listening to us. Uh, let me make three broad points. One, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, I think every country would have its perspective or its definition uh, or its sense of what the Indo-Pacific is about. Uh, viewed from the Indian perspective, and I want you to look at the map behind me, uh, in 1991, 92, when India started its economic reforms, India essentially looked to the ASEAN in that direction. And as the ASEAN relationship grew, it looked beyond the ASEAN. Now, in the 25 years that have passed, what started as a narrow economic trade relationship has acquired broader dimensions. And in fact, more than half of India's trade today goes east of India rather than west of India, which used to be the tradition. Uh, so uh, to some extent, if you look from an Indian perspective, we used to call it the look east policy, then we called it the act east policy because there was a connectivity element and a security element that got added on. Indo-Pacific is the next step because once India moves east of ASEAN and its key trading partners today are China, Japan, Korea, Australia. Uh, so uh, the, the first point is for us, it's a kind of eastward movement. The second issue is uh, historic, I, I would say, particularly after we got independence in 1947, because it was, the independence was accompanied by partition. In many ways, India's horizons shrank. Okay. And it suited a lot of other countries to keep us in a much narrower South Asian box, rather than look at the full expanse of India. And there's a reason why the Indian Ocean is called the Indian Ocean. So. Uh, part of Indo-Pacific is also to get out of the South Asian box. Uh, and the third issue is we still think the foundation of Indo-Pacific is the Indian Ocean. And if you take Indian Ocean as the foundation from India's perspective, the Pacific is a sort of peaceful periphery, or sometimes not so peaceful periphery, uh, of that. So all powers like if to... to secure the core also would like to have influence on the periphery. So from a strategic perspective, actually, the way Japan would look westwards into the Indian Ocean, we would have a very differing eastwards perspective. That's my first broad point. The second uh, issue, Indo-Pacific, before we actually came on this panel, we were sort of arguing about the origins of the term. And I, I do agree that uh, if, you know, definitely Prime Minister Abe uh, deserves the credit for introducing it as a contemporary strategic term at a, by a politician, by a political leader. Uh, he, I think, was perhaps in 2007 a little ahead of his times, uh, but developments have caught up with his forecast. Uh, and uh, what he said in 2007 today is much more uh, an accepted reality here. But I want you to distinguish here between what is a, a, a strategic term and what is the landscape and what is the history. Because Indo-Pacific has actually existed in history. You know, you can, I'm now again giving you an Indian perspective here. You can trace the influence of Indian culture in history all the way through Southeast Asia, through Indonesia, to the Vietnam coast, up to the Fujian coast of China. So that, that is, to my mind, historically Indo-Pacific at work. You would see the reverse flow. You would have you know, people from South Pacific actually come all the way to Africa, again in history. But look at modern history. You know, in, in modern history, uh, uh, I mean, not many people would recall that in fact, the first 
military unit which landed in Haiphong in 1945, uh, uh, the Allied military unit, was an Indian military unit. Now, through the 19th century, actually forces out of India uh, were, were deployed all over the Pacific coast. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, you saw the other way, you know, the reverse flow as well. You know, one, one of the interesting events in the history of Singapore uh, was uh, there was a big army mutiny in 1915 where actually a Japanese marine unit helped to put, came to the help of the British to put down a mutiny in Singapore. So historically, there was actually uh, a, a sense of Indo-Pacific. In modern history, there was a sense of Indo-Pacific. The British certainly acted like there was an Indo-Pacific, but under the British, it was neither free nor open. Uh, the, uh, why did it not remain Indo-Pacific? Here, my, my thought uh, for, for the day is, actually, the US, you know, the, the primacy of the United States after 1945, and the focus on the Pacific, and the focus on the Gulf on the other side a little bit later, I think they destroyed that unity of, a, of an integrated theater and created two separate theaters the Indian Ocean Theater and the Pacific Theater. And today, the, the geopolitics has taken a different turn. Uh, and you have Pacific powers coming into the Indian Ocean. You have Indian Ocean powers going out there. My third very brief point, when you look, we are today discussing Indo-Pacific as a strategy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now I'm now using this term as a strategic term. I think there are today two Indo-Pacific powers. One is the United States, which is deeply resident in the Indian Ocean and very well entrenched in the Pacific Ocean. The other is China, because it is actually the moment of the, the Chinese maritime presence in the Indian Ocean, uh, which, which flows out of a policy level uh, decision in the 18th Party Congress in 2012, uh, that China would become a maritime power. Uh, that uh, so if you look at it on a sort of a permanent basis, there are today two navies, which are both in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and they're the American Navy and the Chinese Navy. Whereas the Japanese come in sometimes, Indians go out to the Pacific Ocean sometimes, the Australians traverse it sometimes, the French come in from time to time. But uh, while we talk about Indo-Pacific, I think the Chinese in many ways are doing it without uh, necessarily endorsing the concept. Fascinating. Well, you touched on uh, the geographic construct of the Indo-Pacific, and I, I must say that it reminds me, as a diplomat, uh, the intriguing experience of going from country to country and seeing the further I traveled in the conference rooms of foreign ministries and presidential offices, maps of the world with uh, their country in the center. And I remember the experience of disorientation. Wait a second, that's not what the world map ought to look like. And it was a, a bit of an education uh, for me. So there's a geographic dimension to the Indo-Pacific. There's a historical uh, dimension to it as certainly as a concept and certainly a political and and strategic matter and I think really the 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 democracy piece and the free and open piece is tremendously important and will ultimately I think uh, hold the answer to the question of whether a free and open indo pacific is more than just a historical legacy or a a term of art, whether it's really a, uh, a unifying principle that can bring the region uh, together around a, a set of common values. Um, but it, Psyche Sun also pointed out that it began in large part as an economic construct, uh, the need to make connectivity to build prosperity, and that's certainly a big part of why China is so visible not only in the Pacific but in the Indian Ocean as well, uh, with part of its maritime Silk Road, uh, its Belt and Road, etc. But I'd like to throw out the proposition that 
the free and open Indo-Pacific, this concept also from the beginning had a security dimension to it, had a defense dimension to it. Because when you think about uh, what was going on in the world, uh, this was a time when uh, the Chinese were beginning to flex their muscles in the South China Sea and the Paracels and the Spratlys. That was certainly a concern to uh, our governments, to the Australians and to others. And that's perhaps part of the driver behind the other topic that we should touch on, which is the quadrilateral security dialogue. That was uh, born in the very same year as the speech by Prime Minister Abe and uh, then Indian Prime Minister Singh and uh, Prime Minister Abe and uh, Australian Prime Minister Howard and from the United States, uh, Vice President Dick Cheney uh, came together on the margins of a meeting and, uh, and decided to uh, launch the quad, so to speak, and uh, they did it in part in tandem with deciding to open the annual US-India exercise, maritime exercise Malabar, to participation by both Japan and Australia. Uh, so there was clearly a security dimension to it. I, I would add to that that it occurs to me as you speak that in 2007, uh, frankly from 2001 through 2007, the center of US strategic focus was in the Gulf, was oriented around uh, Iraq in the first instance and secondarily Afghanistan. The rebalance to Asia um, advocated and pursued by President Obama and the Obama administration was born of a twin sense that both in security terms and in economic terms, the United States was underinvested in the, in the Asia Pacific region. And in effect, what you're saying is that the logical extension, the progression from uh, an Iraq centric strategy to an Asia Pacific strategy is in fact an Indo Pacific strategy, which is uh, ironically and maybe elegantly coming full circle as you describe it. Mm. Well, look, uh, on, the, on the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, it broadly has to do with uh, the outlook of countries and the values of countries, but in a way, I would suggest to you that it is broader, because le let me give you an example, okay. What are, the th what are the big issues in the Indo-Pacific? Maritime security, maybe terrorism, connectivity. Now, uh, I think the, the broad basis on which uh, till now, uh, the, certainly I can say this for the Indian Ocean, because Indian Ocean in a way has a stronger character than the Pacific Ocean. It's historically, uh, been because it's monsoon driven, so there's a stronger historical basis for an integrated culture in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the the character of the Indian Ocean is very much pluralistic, very interpenetrative, uh, very much consultative. So so when we talk today of a free and open uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. We don't necessarily have to see it in terms of what are the political practices of societies necessarily at home. I, I think we have to see how, what is the behavior of states in approaching this issue. And uh, the expectation would be that uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific would sort of look at a much more consultative model to, for example, issue, uh, address an issue like connectivity. Uh, it would look at you know, local ownership, at viability of projects, uh, at transparency of projects. Similarly, if there are uh, global challenges, uh, disaster responses, uh, you know, how do countries work together? Uh, and these will happen, and they are happening. Uh, 
so I, I think the whole in a in a sense I would say uh, there is a there is a kind of a political culture that we are talking about when we use the word uh, <coughs> free and open in the Pacific. So I wouldn't take it literally as some people have suggested it should be. Sikhsan, do you see the same political culture in East Asia and the Pacific Yeah, region? I can't agree with what you just uh, Jay said. You know, uh, in my earlier uh, remarks, I mentioned that the center of the economic growth has shifted from outside Asia to Asia, Pacific region, which includes all these countries in the region, including India, of course. Um, there are, of course, economic dimension, as you said, and also the security dimension in this concept. Um, just to um, share some of the facts and figures with the audience, let me uh, cite uh, these figures with you. Um, there is a huge demand for construct construction of infrastructure in this region, including Pacific uh, Islands or East Asia, South Asia, West Asia, in any countries in this region. Um, Asian Development Bank, they released a report two years ago. And in that report, I found that out of 67 member countries of the ADB Bank, 45 of them are so-called developing country members. And they need $22.6 trillion of investment in order to maintain the level of economic prosperity which they are enjoying now. It's a huge, huge money. And particularly, building of infrastructure in the sector of electricity. They, they need $14.7 trillion. And secondly, investment is necessary in transportation and uh, uh, traffic sector. It's $8.4 8 .4 trillion. And then comes telecommunication. It's $2.3 trillion, and water, sewage. So all these uh, sectors are really necessary to sustain basic human lives. And uh, the countries in the region, as I mentioned, there are 40, uh, yeah, 40 something. They all require investment from outside. They cannot just do it by themselves. And I think it is in these sectors that uh, relatively advanced economies should extend helping hands to construct infrastructure. And this is the basic uh, uh, idea behind promoting the vision of free and open in the Pacific. In order for us to make uh, this vision uh, a reality, we need to have the free passage of uh, oceans we need to have uh, uh, secure passage of vessels in the waters. So the security, uh, I think, dimensions come in this uh, in, in this concept. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the uh, uh, what about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the security aspect? You know, Jay mentioned that uh, the political systems, the regimes may be different from one to another. And they, uh, Japan doesn't really care about, uh, you know, of course, we do care that the democracies will be established and spread in the region. But the countries have different systems, and we cannot force any country to change from their own system to, into democracy. Demo democracy takes different uh, you know, forms in any country. US system cannot be forced to other countries. I think we, we need to have some patience in, in, in watching the development, political development in any country in the region. But uh, um, at least uh, we hope that uh, all these countries could abide by international law. Some, um, um, we see some uh, territorial disputes or claims of territorial sovereignty in some of the small islands or the small you know, piece of uh, uh, lands or the waters, even public, uh, this is, we consider this uh, the, the public asset for you know, any country. But uh, sometimes some countries uh, uh, are claiming that they belong to their own uh, uh, territory, changing the, uh, 
the uh, status quo unilaterally uh, using force or using the threat of force. And these, these things we don't uh, uh, really uh, accept. And we hope that uh, you know, uh, international law would be uh, established uh, at least in the, in the region that uh, include the Indo-Pacific region. That is the, really the sincere hope of Japan in this uh, matter. In the eight years of the Obama administration that was articulated by the U.S. government uh, in its passion for promoting a rules-based order mm. in the broad Asia-Pacific region, and uh, we combined that with a policy of seeking to both participate in and to strengthen regional institutions uh, both for rule setting and norm setting, but also to create venues where countries can uh, exchange views and, and litigate or adjudicate uh, some of the differences short of war or uh, the international court. Well, Ambassador Saiki, you've given such a, a vivid description of the demand signal for infrastructure in the entire region that you've made me want to go out and buy stock in Mitsubishi and Tata <laughs> Industries. You're clearly in the right business at the right time. And we are investing a lot, actually. But well, not just not, for the company's interest, uh, don't worry. And Japan has invested a lot uh, in the form of the, uh, the push for partnership for quality infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is another hallmark initiative of your prime minister. Uh, and India as well is seeking to uh, support and make available infrastructure opportunities on a commercial as well as on a national basis. But the big player in infrastructure, of course, is China. Mm. And the banner initiative uh, for connectivity and for infrastructure uh, development, not only around the uh, Indo-Pacific, but around the world, is the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. So let me ask both of you, how should we regard uh, the BRI? Uh, Japan sent a very prominent uh, political figure two years ago to the Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, uh, Nikai, the chairman of the ruling party. Uh, Ge General Secretary of the party is a title that Xi Jinping can relate to. Uh, the Prime Minister of India uh, demurred at attending personally uh, in 2017. I don't know what the plan is, but I do know that he's uh, been, he's participated in Belt and Road related, no. ex not, not Belt and Road projects, but that India has uh, engaged in at least exploratory well, let me not speak for India then. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll go back. I'll stick with the question. Um, is how do you view, how should we view the Belt and Road Initiative, and how does India view it? Well, uh, uh, when the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, you know, the conference took place in 2017, uh, uh, at that time, we made our position very clear. Uh, we, we, I, I would say we have an overall position on connectivity, which is autonomous of the Belt and Road. It would apply to a Japanese initiative or an American initiative. We also had some specific concerns about the Chinese initiative. I think the first issue for us is that any connectivity uh, initiative should be respectful of sovereignty. Uh, now, uh, the reason I uh, stress that is that uh, one of the corridors, the so-called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, passes through the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, and that is land which is uh, illegally held by Pakistan, and part of it has been illegally ceded to China. And bear in mind that uh, you're talking of a, of a uh, certain amount of real estate, for which actually Pakistan is not legally claiming ownership, nor is China legally claiming ownership. But India is the only sovereign legal claimant of that land. So uh, the fact that 
uh, Indian sovereignty was disregarded is obviously something which was uh, difficult for India to overlook. So I think that primarily shaped uh, the response. But there is a larger issue on connectivity, and the issue on connectivity to is really, as I said, is it consultative? Because by definition, connectivity is connecting different countries and different regions. So should we, are we better served by a consultative process or by a unilateral process where one player is driving connectivity for their particular interests? And again, I'm not uh, singling out a country. I mean, tomorrow, if one of your countries was to do something similar, I would raise the same point. Uh, the, uh, the, I think the issues would be, is it consultative? Number two, is it commercially viable? And that's important because if it is not commercially viable, and yet you are going through with connectivity initiatives, then I think the natural question it would evoke is, are there hidden agendas? Uh, I think there is then an issue of what is the local ownership and local involvement in that connectivity project. I think the connectivity, you see, because of the, of the period of colonial rule, Asia, is, Asia has been fragmented. Yeah. The natural connectivities of Asia were broken up. Uh, the natural connectivities of the Indian Ocean were broken up. So there's no question that Asia today needs more connectivity. But because there is a demand, that it's also important that the supply is done in the right way. Yeah. So uh, what you don't want is that the, the cure is worse than the disease in a way. Uh, so I, I think it's important today to have honest conversations on connectivity and try and move the connectivity uh, conversation towards a more consultative mode where there is a broader buy-in of all, uh, all parties. And, to my mind, again, that would be part of uh, a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. Sykeson, so, what's your view on uh, Belt and Road? You know, uh, BRI, we call it now. It used to be called the One Belt, One Road Initiative. This is an initiative proposed by uh, Xi Jinping's government of China. Um, this is a grand, uh, of course, vision. and. Uh, under this uh, initiative, uh, 65 countries are covered. And the GDP total of these 65 countries is about 31% 30, of the entire world GDP. One third of the world GDP is covered under this initiative. And population is about 63% of the world population. It's all covered under this uh, initiative. Um, I don't know about the hidden agenda, but uh, certainly many developing countries re need the investment, as I said earlier, for building their infrastructure. And Chinese uh, um, extending helping hands to build the infrastructure, uh, I think they have been met with uh, some mixed feelings, actually, when we look at the example in Sri Lanka, uh, port development, and also some case in uh, Pakistan. These uh, projects uh, are not 100% uh, successful because it, I don't think it has elevated the Chinese reputation. Uh, people, I think, it, on the receiving side may have uh, some apprehension about uh, the real objective of China uh, propelling this uh, initiative. But in our case, Japan, uh, some people, of course, at the beginning had the apprehension about the, uh, this initiative. But uh, we have uh, reminded the Chinese at the summit meeting recently took place in Beijing uh, between Xi Jinping and Abe that um, uh, as long as the uh, BRI projects uh, are open to any countries or any companies who are willing to participate, that's OK. And as long as the tender process is transparent, to any companies who want to take part in it. That's fine. And as long as the debt sustainability is ensured, see, countries borrow money from China through banks, and they need to pay back in 30 years' term of 40 years. 
but it's in some cases, it turned out that uh, the receiving country was not able to pay back the money they borrowed. So the, in this particular case, the port uh, ownership has been shifted to the Chinese company on the 1990-year loan term, I forgot. Anyway, um, I think the, uh, the BRI projects need to match the international standard. China is still claiming that it is a developing country, but it is already you know, assisting the other, the other developing countries. So international standards or norms need to be respected and abided by, by any lenders of the money or the assistance. This is a very, I think, bottom line for Japan. So for that matter, we don't, of course, raise any objection to the BRI projects as long as they meet these three or four conditions which I just stipulated. That's our position. Well, yeah. you, I mean, you've both uh, enumerated a number of really important principles, and I, I believe that uh, Japan intends in its host year of the G20 at the uh, Osaka summit at the end of June to uh, seek agreement on some guiding principles for uh, quality infrastructure, and that would, uh, I'm sure, be, be very welcome. One other thing which I just mentioned is that you know, our friends in Asia do not want to be put in the position to choose either China or Japan. They don't want to be forced to choose one of the two. So uh, we fully understand that. And uh, if, uh, if uh, offers are made cheap, I mean inexpensively, I think uh, rece recipients uh, would like to uh, take the offer. But if the quality of the project is uh, not that good, they will regret later. In terms of the, uh, the competition uh, over the cost of construction, I think China is far ahead of uh, Japan. They are doing much, much better. We always uh, you know, are behind them. But uh, when it comes to the quality of the project, I think the, uh, the uh, Japanese companies have a strong pride, high pride in ensuring the recipients that the, the projects will last for 50, 60, 70 years without any repair. This is what, you know, the difference that we're making. Well, the right kind of competition brings out the best in uh, everybody, and uh, it makes a lot of sense based on the principles of uh, consultation, of transparency, of sustainability, of environmental responsibility, of probity, anti-corruption, some of the things that you've mentioned. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to try for a kind of healthy, clean competition that's going to develop uh, that's going to result in uh, a, sat a satisfactory, if not better, outcome, not only for uh, the companies or the source nation, but for the host and for the people as well. Let me pull back, if I could, to something that we touched on early on, which is the Quad. Mm. So the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue was initiated, as I mentioned, in uh, late 2007 by these four leaders. and. So 12 years later, as best I can tell, it's had a grand total of one meeting at the leader level, the inaugural level, the inaugural meeting in 2007. Uh, there was a long gap for a variety of reasons when uh, Quad didn't meet, although there were other mini-lateral form formats uh, for meetings. Um, our defense institutions have been uh, often more successful in finding ways to engineer practical cooperation, but as a political or a diplomatic matter, really only in the last uh, two years or so, there have been a few meetings at the joint secretary level, the director general, or uh, in the case of the United States, the acting assistant secretary. No foreign ministerials, uh, not a whole lot uh, to show. And unlike, say, a different regional uh, grouping, uh, such as ASEAN or the East Asia Summit or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, founded and led by China, 
there's no institution, there's no secretariat, there's no regularity to uh, the Quad meeting. So people talk about it, but does it really exist? <laughs> well, uh, you know, um, there's no problem for Japan to have uh, the gatherings uh, in this uh, you know, setting of war. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, this format of uh, uh, four in a room would be the best way of uh, promoting uh, further cooperation uh, in the region. Um, the, I don't want to be seen that uh, four of us getting together discussing things which are not you know, uh, really uh, uh, comfortable hmm, to uh, some players outside this group. This is not a gang up thing that we are going to uh, do. And uh, if uh, some players outside this uh, loop feel uncomfortable, then we don't force uh, this uh, format to uh, be activated. Um, rather, we, Japan is quite comfortable already with the trilateral format, Japan, US, and, Japan, uh, and uh, India, or Japan, uh, uh, US, and Australia. And I think we are doing fine with, in this format. So uh, instead of a quad, maybe a trio, a, uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, may uh, be less uh, provocative. That's my view. I don't know how Jay feels about this. Well, uh, I'd put it a little differently. You know, look, I think some of the complaints about quad is like saying my football team didn't score a home run because you're describing the wrong game. <laughs> And who runs the quad? Okay, the foreign ministries of the government's concern. Okay. When foreign ministries run something, what do they do? They are supposed to discuss foreign policy. Okay, that's what foreign ministries do. So what, what has happened with the quad debate is people are assigning to the quad roles and responsibilities and expectations, which were never intended to be those of quad. Now, uh, to my mind, what is the quad? The quad, uh, I mean, first of all, Daddy, you've been an assistant secretary, so have we. Uh, if you ask me in a, in a ministry who really has a policy grip, you, we all know it's the assistant secretary. Okay, so. <laughs> no, no argument. Huh? Right. So if, if you, actually, you know, there's a reason why they actually picked that level. They pick that level because these are people who have a strong sense of that uh, geographical domain that they're dealing with. Uh, and uh, they are, in that sense, able to talk about different issues uh, in that domain. So I, I think this, this obsession that it must have political level visibility, or that it must somehow be you know, weaponized in some way, you know, the naval side is too weak. Or, you know, I, I think this is just misunderstanding what it was about. It was meant as a diplomatic consultation and coordination forum of countries who have convergences, who do not agree on every issue, but have substantial common ground. Uh, and to my mind, you should leave well alone. It works. It, the, it has a good agenda uh, to the best of, I mean, I saw its first meeting when I was still foreign secretary, but the best that I know, it has continued to uh, function well. Uh, and you know, in a in a sense, if you, if you look at the the aggregate that it covers, I mean, today we have a India U.S. Japan trilateral, we have a India Japan Australia trilateral, we have uh, two plus two with U.S., we have two plus two with Japan, uh, we have. We don't have it. I don't think we have a two plus two with Australia, but if you if you look at the uh, the quality of relations amongst the quads, bilaterally, trilaterally, plurilaterally, it's all growing, and I think the quad kind of pulls all the threads together uh, and and has that sensible discussion about it. So I'm you know for me the issue is not whether. Uh, you know, somebody is insecure about it or not. I mean, if they are insecure, insecure about it, they should find common ground with the Quad, and I'm sure if they find enough common ground, the Quad will be called the Pentagon. 
We've already got one Pentagon, uh, <laughs> but I, I take your point. Well, uh, we're going to turn to questions in just one moment, but let me pose one last question before I turn it over to the esteemed audience. What is it that you, India, and Japan are looking for from the United States in the effort to build this uh, free, open, prosperous, uh, consultative uh, Indo-Pacific region? Um, yeah. I don't want to sound critic. I mean, sound... Uh, You're in New York, you can... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I don't want to cr criticize the uh, U.S. administration, but uh, what I want to uh, ask the uh, U.S. is to uh, please show more commitment to the region, not just by word, but by, through the actions and through concrete progr programs and projects to assist the uh, countries in the region. Of course, we'll do our own job, but together we can do a better job. This is, uh, this is uh, my view, and it's, I'm hoping that... Uh, the U.S. administration, uh, supported by the Congress, will uh, uh, give more budget hmm, uh, to individual projects which uh, we can plan and we can uh, implement together. So this is my, my, my request, actually, to the U.S. side. So it sounds like the U.S. has an issue with commitment, what you're saying. No, actually, uh, we are a bit confused by the American approach. You know, well, Danny San, I mean, Danny San said that uh, during the Obama administration in time, um, the, uh, the uh, rebalancing was a key word. Now, where is the re rebalancing now? With the change of administration, that word is gone. And what, what is America doing now? It's true that uh, President Trump did deliver a speech in Vietnam, uh, when was this, uh, two years back? Anyway, in, in that speech, he, he used the term free and open in the Pacific. But in the same speech, he uh, talked about uh, unilateralism. So, um, you know, we, we were confused. And we want the Americans to exercise more um, influence of goodwill in the region. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just say, Saikson, to your point, uh, the new budget uh, proposed by the White House uh, in the last two mm -hmm. weeks for the fiscal year 2020 uh, worrisomely uh, cuts spending mm -hmm. for the Department of State and for the U.S. Agency for International Development by 24%. Mm. Uh, so the... Uh, but the economic support and the development assistance uh, would be uh, much, much lower than uh, what Congress appropriated last year if the budget were passed. What we've seen uh, so far is that uh, Congress has restored a very significant amount of the funding that the administration had cut from the budget, but your point is still valid. It's not enough to proclaim uh, policy slogans uh, to be credible in the region, the United States has to really demonstrate uh, staying power. Ambassador Deschamps. Okay. Uh, well, as you said, since we are in New York, uh, <laughs> let, let me feel free to criticize both the U.S. and Japan oh. on this call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And I'll tell you why. I, I think if you ask me today what is a serious strategic shortcoming it is that uh, we are still talking alliance and thinking alliance. When the days of alliances are, if not over, suddenly their, their importance has come down. Saikisan asked, saying, where is the rebalancing? Not the Indo-Pacific rebalancing. There is a global rebalancing. And that rebalancing today is bringing in powers who were not in global calculations and not in alliance calculations earlier. So I think somewhere, uh, you know, the US and Japan, both individually and together, need to make up their mind. Are they still going to be applying a, a 1960s, 70s, 80s model to a 2020s situation? Uh, I, I, I mean, to my mind, 
if you are looking at the uh, the sort of the new landscape, the changes which have happened in the last 30, 40 years, I think everybody needs to revisit their calculations and come up with different models of cooperation, much more flexible, much more open-minded, uh, where the, the name of the game is really to find common ground among countries uh, that, that work together. So uh, if you ask me, so what is my expectation of the United States? It is that the US, that US thinking would show that flexibility. And, and I'm not disheartened. I, I think in some ways, I mean, the American system in totality has started to, to sort of absorb that. Uh, but obviously, we'd like to see that uh, unfold in a, in a sort of uh, more productive manner. Can, well, I, can I say something? You didn't criticize Japan, so it's OK. Um, <laughs> no, the alliance thinking bit. You know, um, I remember that when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she came to uh, uh, the Philippines for a multinational, multilateral meeting. And she gave a major speech at that time in which everybody was excited to hear when, when they heard that she was saying that we are back in this region. We are back in this region. She announced this. She declared this. And we waited. And the countries in Southeast Asia, obviously, they are very disappointed now because the declaration made by the Secretary of State has not been accompanied by any concrete actions afterwards. And this administration, as you said, cutting the budget of the State Department, we cannot expect too much. But what I'm trying to say is that the change of government should not betray the expectation of the countries in the region. Of course, America has its own policy. That's fine. But you know, the commitment has to be implemented. This, I think, is the very basic thing that you need to uh, keep. Well, there's certainly been a discontinuity uh, in the last two years from many traditions, uh, long-held traditions, of American foreign policy. And I, I will not belabor that. I do think that there was a, uh, a bright, shining moment uh, in the Obama administration in which uh, we demonstrated the flexibility that embraced simultaneously uh, strengthened alliances. And there is, I think, still uh, great value in alliances with uh, flexible partnerships. And the United States really began, I think, uh, vigorously to develop its security cooperation, not only with India, but with uh, Vietnam with Indonesia, uh, with quite a few other countries in the broader Indo-Pacific region, without making uh, a stark differentiation uh, between ally and non-ally. And in fact, in the case of the Philippines, uh, the United States shifted to an access-based uh, security uh, cooperation, which uh, was a real departure from the old Cold War, Subic, uh, Clark Air Base. So I think that the direction that you're pointing in is one that US uh, policymakers and strategists have recognized is the direction of the future. And hopefully that we will get back onto that track. But we should get back onto the track of hearing from the good people in the audience. And let me begin, if I may, uh, by the lady at the end of the third row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yoshita Singh. I'm with Press Trust of India. Uh, my question is for Dr. Uh, Jay Shankar. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the India-China dynamics, uh, especially after uh, last week's uh, when China again blocked the UNSC proposal to designate Masood Azhar. Uh, how do you see it impacting or uh, having an impact on India-China bilateral relations? And how do you see this issue being resolved? Uh, the US, France, UK had uh, uh, co-sponsored this proposal, and uh, it really had a, a huge impact on how, uh, uh, on the, uh, in India's fight against terrorism in the UN. So your thoughts on how do you th see this going forward, and whether it will be resolved by the two nations, by India and China? Thank you. Well, I don't know if uh, my thoughts would be particularly 
helpful to you. I, I think this is an issue that the Chinese have to think through for themselves. You know, what, what, what is the signal they are sending? That was crisp. <laughs> yes, the gentleman right here. Thank you. My name is Kevin McMullen. I have a question for Ambassador Psyche, please. You referred to uh, the rebalancing uh, not coming to fruition either the Obama administration or the Trump administration. Isn't the real reason for this lack of resources, that the United States no longer has the ability to do that? When I was a student at Leavenworth, we had 19 divisions in the U.S. Army. We're way down. We had 600 ships in the U.S. Navy. We're now 280 something. Uh, the Air Force has shrunk, and we're scheduled to lose two more fighter squadrons uh, in the coming year. Uh, we've also spent a lot of money resources on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. It doesn't seem that we have the resources, unfortunately, uh, to rebalance in a significant way. And in uh, the professional journals, like the uh, Naval War College Review, uh, you see letters now from American officers saying we're just going to have to accept that Red China is going to run the Far East. That's a tough question. I mean, it, I think uh, basically the, uh, the White House has to make a strategic decisions about what the United States should be doing in this region and also elsewhere. And uh, of course, militarily, I, I appreciate the, uh, the efforts being made by the US uh, you know, um, allies. Uh, and friends uh, all over the world. But I, I was talking about the um, more economic dimension of uh, what should be done in the region earlier in my remarks. Thank you. OK, the floor is open. Uh, let me see. There's a, do I see a hand up over there? No. Uh, OK, there's a gentleman right in the center. It's hard to the, see. Uh, yeah, yes. In the second row. <laughs> This looks like an Indo-Pacific horizon. <laughs> uh, hello, my, my question is best posed to, uh, I, I believe, everyone on the panel. Um, with regards to uh, what this gentleman just said and the American sort of uh, reposturing away from multilateralism and away from East Asia, uh, does Japan have a role in uh, its defense posture, maybe readjusting that in the future? What was the last part of the question? I couldn't. Uh, does Japan maybe have a role in readjusting its defense posture in light of this? We are a middle power. And in that map, you see a very small island nation there. We have our own, of course, uh, responsibility. And we will do our best within the scope of our responsibility. But we cannot stretch our strength beyond the ability. This is all I can say to you now. But we are very, very aware of the increasing security situation, the, our, the, uh, the insecure situation uh, uh, surrounding Japan. That is why I think the Japanese government in, in December uh, decided to increase the defense budget. Uh, I think uh, this is a very, very uh, important decision made by the Mr. Abe's government lately. So we are doing our best. But we cannot replace, we cannot replace the American forces anywhere. Okay. Uh, yes, there's a gentleman right here in the red tie. My question is for Ambassador Jay Shankar. Two of them. One, China has openly stated that India, in the Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. So they built a string of pearls, as you know, all around it. And secondly, the Pacific Ocean is not the United States Ocean. So they want them to be kicked out by 2025. So Sorry, I, I didn't hear the second part. Second is that Pacific Ocean is not the United States Ocean. So not the United States is oh. Ocean. They want it out from there by 2025. Now, India is having a strategic dynamic with Vietnam. Can you throw some more light on that? Is that as a way to enter the South China Sea to counter China? No, look, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not very sure that anybody has actually said the things you said that they have. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, when you say China has said that, I mean, uh, we need to be a bit 
careful about exact, you know, there, there are opinions voiced in their media and uh, uh, I, 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 would, I would sort of uh, caution that we should take sort of official positions a little more seriously here. Uh, let, let me tell you how I see it play out. I mean, what we already have uh, uh, noted over the last, I would say, 10 years plus, maybe 15 years, is uh, obviously the Chinese Navy has grown. Uh, that uh, China has built facilities. Uh, some of them are more openly a military character. Some of them have a more uh, uh, sort of dual purpose character. Uh, and so you are seeing Chinese activity in areas where historically China has not been there. Uh, and that is uh, the uh, reflection of a power which has grown immensely in its size and uh, in its military uh, capabilities. Now, it cannot be that any power expects that other powers would vacate areas for its convenience. You know, after all, every power would naturally want to exercise influence through demonstrated activity. So, I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, not very comfortable with the way in which you posed it, which is, I want this this country out of this place and that country, it doesn't belong there. Uh, I think what you are going to see is much more interpenetration. Uh, you, go, you know, you're going to see definitely, I mean, the American Navy is going to be in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. The Chinese Navy will be in both. I, I think you will see Japanese Navy a fair amount in the Indian Ocean. You have seen the Indian Navy in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, some of the European navies, we just had, a, in fact, a European uh, fleet visit to India. So you will have European navies, the British, the French uh, there. The Australians will be there. So you're going to get uh, a picture of much more uh, sort of, uh, shall I say, uh, naval activity, cross-cutting naval activities. And that, to my mind, would, would erase that compartmentalization of two theaters that this is Indian and that is Pacific and I stay here and you stay there. I, I think those days are over. I mean, already, the reality is today uh, many navies and many countries are crossing over. I would go one step further and argue that uh, what is really important is the universal applicability of the rules and the freedoms, in this case, of the maritime space. Uh, the freedom of the seas. Where there are problems, it's not because this is my ocean because of the proximity of my country. Uh, where there are problems is when nations that are strong enough to exert uh, control over international space disregard those universal rules and instead claim rights uh, or deny rights and access uh, to others in a way that's inconsistent. So I was frequently asked uh, by Chinese audiences and Chinese interlocutors uh, during the tough debates that I had as a US diplomat over issues regarding the uh, island building in the Spratleys or uh, US naval operations in the Paracels. Well, how would you feel if a Chinese ship came to the Gulf of Mexico or came uh, off of Hawaii or Guam? And the answer fortuitously was handed to me when four naval vessels of the People's Liberation Army uh, entered U.S. territorial water in the Bering Strait off Alaska coincidentally or not, uh, concurrent with a visit by the US president to Alaska. And before I had a chance to phone home, the Pentagon issued a statement saying that it uh, accepted and welcomed the peaceful transit, the lawful transit of these naval ships through U.S. territory, that is a right that the United States claims, not on its own behalf, but on behalf of all nations. And I think this goes right to the heart of 
uh, the point that Saiki san made uh, early on about uh, the importance of a, a consistent set of rules, the importance of norms. And I think, therefore, that uh, even beyond the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, there is a, a, a broader global space. Another very important global domain that is uh, being contested now is cyberspace. Mm. And the, I think, undertold story is the risk of uh, national boundaries in cyberspace that will impede the movement of data, uh, impede the movement of information. And to me, this goes back to the need for uh, US leadership, not denominated in warships, not even denominated simply in dollars, but denominated in the conviction on the part of uh, countries around the world uh, that uh, the most powerful nation, the United States, is committed not to uh, put America first, but instead uh, to act in the best interests of the entire international community. We have time, though, for another question. And I see a gentleman in a green sweater, I think. <clears throat> Wang from Chinese consulate in New York. Perfect. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I, I remember when we open, uh, start a, a Belt and Road initiative, I open our arms to all the countries, including United States, Japan, India. But finally, we didn't get any, any positive answer from <laughs> your three countries. And even during Obama administration, we're considering joining APP, APP, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. But finally, TPP died because of the change of administration. Now, we, uh, my understanding is that uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy is now more talk on paper, less in action. But uh, when someday we find that the mechanism is good, China wants to join in. How's your feeling? And uh, are we welcomed? <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Wong. Let me take one crack and then uh, ask my colleagues to uh, respond. What does it mean to belong to the Belt and Road Initiative? Many countries have signed MOUs and so on. But what, for, I won't speak for Ambassador Saiki, but what he mentioned was, will the contracts be open to our companies to bid on? Will the projects uh, involve commercial uh, lenders and therefore American and other banks. So the, the first question I pose is what does it mean uh, for China to, uh, for other countries to belong to the Belt and Road? We know what it means to belong to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It means that a country has demonstrated and uh, it's adherence to very high standards in, and made very, very specific uh, commitments. Uh, so I think openness uh, in the free and open Indo-Pacific can't simply be a, a signature on a blank piece of paper. Uh, it needs to represent uh, the accessibility uh, to all countries of uh, the benefits of active participation in, in regional undertakings. Can I just uh, you know, react to what you said? Uh, I, I, I hope I understood your question correctly, but the TPP, um, because the United States walked out, um, doesn't mean that it, it is dead. Japan has picked up the negotiation from that point on, and we have negotiated and concluded the so-called TPP-11. Now, this is open to any countries, any countries who would like to join the, uh, this framework, as long as the country is prepared to fulfill the high standard of commitments. So we welcome any countries, including China, for that matter, if China wants to uh, abide by the international uh, rules negotiated by everyone in the game. So you know, United Kingdom or France or wh whoever 
want to come in to this TPP framework. That's fine with us. Well, on that open and positive note, uh, let me thank, uh, first of all, all of you for coming, and certainly thank Ambassador Jay Shankar and Ambassador Saiki for an erudite and uh, really stimulating conversation. <coughs> I know there's a reception uh, out front. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.